Christ is risen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion. The death that Christ died was death to sin once for all. But the life Christ lives is life to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a human being came death, by a human being has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death, and open to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. first reading is from Isaiah. On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll say the psalm together in unison. Give thanks to God who is good. God's mercy endures forever. Let Israel now proclaim God's mercy endures forever. God is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. There is a sound of exultation and victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Most High has triumphed. The right hand of the Most High is exalted. The right hand of the Most High has triumphed. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. God has punished me sorely but did not hand me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter them. I will offer thanks to God. This is the gate of the Holy One. Those who are righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you, for you answered me and have become my salvation. The same stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is God's duty, and it is marvelous in our eyes. On this day, the Holy One has acted. 
we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hosanna, O oh God, Hosanna. O oh, Holy One, send us now success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. We bless you from the house of God. God is the Holy One who has shined upon us. Form a procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to God who is good. God's mercy endures forever. The second reading is from Acts. Peter began to speak to Cornelius and other Gentiles. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. The message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Christ. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look. There is a place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Well, I'm going to ask a question that I think I already know the answer to. Have you seen the movie called The Princess Bride? <laughs> yes. Yes, we have. Okay. So, at the end of The Princess Bride, Princess Buttercup and her true love, Westley, having triumphed over all enemies and over all ridiculous adversity, they gaze into each other's eyes on horseback as the sun begins to set behind them. What we're watching is the imagination of a little boy, right? And he's homesick from school, and his grandfather has come over to read a storybook to him. And so his grandfather is telling him the story, and we're watching what's unfolding in his imagination. And his grandfather is our narrator, too. And he reads, a wave of love swept over them, as they reached for each other, we are hard cut, snatched back to the boy's bedroom. Grandpa closes the book. And the boy says, what? Like, what? And his grandpa says, it's, it's kissing. It's kissing again. Like, you don't want to hear about that. Well, it turns out that he really does, right? He does. We do. We can feel the ending of a story when we arrive there, right? And the deeper we are in the story, the more we hunger for the ending, right? The one that feels right. So, we're all here today, and we're listening, right? We're listening for the resurrection. It's not a storybook. But it's told by a storyteller. And the people who long ago 
wrote it down in what we call the Gospel of Mark, they tell it like this. The agony of the cross, the agony of the crucifixion was over except for the living ones left behind. Jesus, the Holy One of God, Redeemer, Reconciler, Beloved Son, was dead. And at evening, a man named Joseph of Arimathea took his body down and wrapped it and placed him in a tomb cut in the rock. Which was an act of great tenderness. But for all Joseph's solemn tenderness, love and custom demanded that more be done to care for Jesus' body. But agonizingly, that couldn't happen yet. We, in our time, we think about days from sunrise to sunrise. The sun rises, a new day begins. The sun rises again and another day begins. But they, in Jesus' time, they thought of days from sunset to sunset. And with evening on the day Jesus died, it was the Jewish Sabbath. The Sabbath began at sundown, the day of rest when no work could be done. And so these two disciples, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, they had to wait. They had to wait until the next sunset when the Sabbath ended. And as soon as the Sabbath ended, they went out and they bought fragrant spices to go and anoint his body with. But then it was dark, too dark to go. So they had to wait again through another night. And they were up at first light. Or maybe they never went to sleep at all. But at first light, they go to Jesus at last. And what they found is why we're here. The tomb was already open. These tombs, these tombs were made to hold more than one person in niches cut into the walls and sitting on the right side. In one of those niches, there was an angel. And the angel had been waiting, and the angel knew why the women had come there. But everything had changed. The angel says, he has been raised. He is not here. Go, tell his disciples and Peter, that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. Well, they do the go part. <laughs> Rapidly. Mary and Mary went out and fled from the tomb. So, to recap, the angel in the tomb says, don't be alarmed, and they are terrified. The angel says, go, tell his disciples, but terror and amazement having seized them, they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And that's where the book suddenly closes. That's how the Gospel of Mark originally ended. It isn't a storybook. It's the desperate work of a storyteller to narrate the hinge of all history. This is what they chose to write down. Well, it won't surprise you, and if you've looked at the end of the Gospel of Mark, you already know that it took almost no time at all before somebody, or maybe everybody, insisted that this just could not be the last word on Jesus' resurrection. It cannot be people fleeing from a tomb, terrified, disobeying an angel, right? So Mark's gospel got a few more lines, and then it got a few more lines after that. But the question for us today is why did it once seem so important and so right to just close the book? 
so abruptly they were afraid. It's an ending that does not feel like an ending. Well, maybe the first thing that we could wonder about is why the women were terrified. There's an easy part and there's a hard part. The easy part is let us agree that if a shining white figure appeared in this room right now, it would freak us all the way out, right? So there's that, right? But be with Mary and Mary, be with these women, be with these women. They loved him, they loved Jesus. They loved him and they longed for the kingdom of God with him. A kingdom in which they finally would not have to be afraid. They longed for that kingdom so much and they had lost him and they had lost that future in a few days. And now they had even lost his body. Yes, the angel says that he's risen. But what does that mean to them right then as they stood there? What does it really mean to them who had lost so much in these last days that they would see him in Galilee? See him how? They had come to the tomb with these spices to do maybe the only thing that their minds could fix on in a world that had lost its center and now even that was gone. So yes, they are amazed and yes, they are terrified. And I don't think that's hard to imagine at all. But still, why end like that? Why end like that? Well, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? I mean, really afraid of. Really afraid of. What you can't stop thinking about or what you can't let yourself think about. What rises up in you while you're in bed in the middle of the night and suddenly, it's like there's nothing underneath you. The bubble of panic. The thing that you know, you know, you know, is beyond your control and will hurt. Right? What are you afraid of? Jesus is risen from the dead forever. But in our fearful places, our fearful places, our places of unknowing, inside the tomb walls that close around or that we sense out there ahead of us, that's where his resurrection happens for us. That's where it happens again and again and again. He has gone ahead of us into the places where we fear we will be broken and he has broken what we are afraid of. His risen and living body is the testimony and the promise of God that here in him is life. Here is God's final answer to the reality of what we suffer, to the reality of what we're afraid of. He has gone ahead of us through the dark and is ahead of us now. So maybe that's why it ends with their fear. But there's something else too. It might feel frustratingly unlike an ending because it actually isn't one. And that abrupt silence when the book closes, that silence 
is a space, and we get to fill the space. We can fill it with the stories we know, with Jesus coming back to the ones who ran away and those who pretended not to know him and saying peace and lifting them up, telling them that he still needed them to be his people and that they could be. Filling them with his spirit that would send these absolutely ordinary, absolutely unremarkable people on journeys they could not possibly have imagined. Jesus was a nearly invisible person among the poor people of the land out on the far edge of an empire. And the moment that the movement around him became noticeable to anybody in power, his death was orchestrated to make him forgotten. And yet we can go on. We can go on filling that blank silent space where the book closes. We can fill it with people. We can fill it with the Marys who did tell who did tell the others what they had seen with Peter himself, an illiterate fisherman who lived and died as an apostle of Jesus, maybe even in Rome itself. Stephen and Barnabas and Timothy, Apollos, Junia, Thecla, Priscilla, a Greek-speaking enslaved man from Colossae named Onesimus, an Italian military officer named Cornelius, a woman named Dorcas of Joppa who had a cloth-making business and turned it into a mutually supportive community house for widows, poor people in Philippi who sent aid and their love to a Jewish Pharisee named Paul, who had devoted his life to them even though they were ethnically strangers to one another. Phoebe, a leader with authority in the believers at Kencrie, a place we couldn't find on the map, right? Who carried a letter to Roman believers from that same Paul, and the letter said, it is Christ who died, or rather who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ, will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword? No, he wrote. In all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that blank page holds every person between Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome in this moment, this room every person who stands between this moment and that tomb, every person who carried even an ember of trust, even in some small hidden part of themselves, a knowing, a knowing that somehow changed their life, that Jesus carried the peace of God into every crushing place and carried that peace even into his death. And God raised him from the dead and will raise us and will raise everything, world without end. Amen. Happy Easter.
Please stand with me. As we affirm our Easter faith in the words of the Nicene Creed on page 7 of your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. I would invite your petitions at this time, either silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our our prayer. prayer. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that we who have been raised with him may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise forever and ever. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Please greet your neighbors in peace.
morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. We're like bubbling today. It is good to be together today. It is good that the sun has come out for us. <laughs> I want to especially welcome those who are visiting with us this morning. We are so glad that you are with us today. And what, uh, there are some things I especially want you to know. That first, you are welcome to share in all that we are and all that we do as a congregation. There is a place for you here today and always, however you come to be here today. We want to know you, and we want you to know us, right? To change one another by walking together. So we are so glad that you're here. And I especially uh, want everyone to understand that all people are welcome to share in Holy Communion at this altar. It is Christ's gift to us. And it is for the sake of the world, right? And so all people are welcome to this table, regardless of age, right? Um, big people and little people. All are welcome at this table. The way that that will work is our ushers will help us form uh, lines here in the center aisle. And you just receive the bread into your outstretched hands. And then there'll be a person with a chalice to either side of us. You can, you can dip the bread carefully, carefully into the wine. Um, try to keep your fingers out of it. Uh, and well, you know, just brass tacks, right? <laughs> Um, or you can sip from the chalice, or you can touch the chalice when you hear the words of reception, whichever way seems best to you. If it isn't your custom to receive communion in the Episcopal Church, if you're just not ready to today, but you would like to come forward and receive a prayer of blessing over you, just cross your hands over your chest when you approach, and I'll know what you mean. Okay? So in your bulletin, you'll see there are lots of things coming up in our life as a congregation. We have our awesome Wednesday book group is starting a new book that we're excited about in just a couple of weeks. We have a brunch coming up. We have a Mother's Day cake decorating contest coming up. Um, there's a lot on the horizon for us. And I invite you to take part in all of it. But the thing which is most immediately coming up, um, right after this service, uh, we have a beautiful reception that, and with great thanks to all those who contributed to it, beautiful reception with delicious things prepared for us. It'll be outside the church, just through the front doors. And there is an Easter egg hunt. Is anyone here interested in participating in an Easter egg hunt? <laughs> okay. Okay. So. I want to talk just briefly to the people who are Easter egg hunting. OK. OK. So there are people who are Easter egg hunting who are big, and there are people who are Easter egg hunting who are small, right? Everybody gets to Easter egg hunt. But there's only one rule in the Easter egg hunt. And that is that if you walk outside, out into the yard, it'll be out here beside the church. They're under the bushes. They're all over the place. If you walk out there and you look around and you just see an egg, you are too big to pick up that egg. <laughs> and leave that for somebody littler, OK? There are lots and lots and lots of eggs to find. And some of them are hard to find. So OK? So right after the service, we'll go outside. We'll have treats. And just wait. We'll launch you out. We'll launch the Easter egg hunters out kind of at once. So that'll all be right after the service. Is there anything else that would be good for us to hear about this morning, Pauline? OK. OK. 
so St. George's, St. George's uh, pitches in to host the next York Community Supper that on April 16th. The sign-up sheet is out there in the parish hall on the lectern. Is there anything else that would be good for us to hear today? Okay, so there's one last thing we're going to do this morning. It is somebody's, it is Dick Santoro's 82nd birthday today. <laughs> and we should pray for him. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Watch over thy child, O Lord, as his days increase. Bless and guide him wherever he may be. Strengthen him when he stands. Comfort him when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise him up if he falls. And in his heart may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of his life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday, Dave. Beloved, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Holy One, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and fill them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. We acclaim you, holy God, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Holy God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, Jesus lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose, Jesus gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for Christ who died and rose for us, you sent the Holy Spirit, your own first gift for those who believe, to complete your work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for Jesus to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Almighty God, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and descent among the dead, proclaiming Christ's resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting Christ's coming in glory and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. God, our creator, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts 
sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ, Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember Thomas, our bishop, Robert and Shannon, our assisting bishops, and all who minister in your church. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and light and grant that we may find our inheritance with Blessed Mary, with matriarchs, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. All are welcome at God's table.
Please stand. Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, Source, Christ, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.